Aloha and e komo mai. Welcome to the University of Hawaii at Manoa Center for Southeast Asian Studies webinar series. We are very pleased to host Dr. Grace Cheng today, who earned her MA in Asian Studies and her PhD in Political Science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her 2002 PhD dissertation entitled Culture for Development and Development for Culture is the Ideology of the Day, The Politics of Culture in Vietnam's Post-1986 Transition, focused on Vietnam, but she has a much broader dossier which she brings today when she speaks to us. Uh, Dr. Chang taught for some time at Hawaii Pacific University and she left to join San Diego State University, where she currently serves as the director for the Center for Human Rights and continues to teach courses in political science and history. Dr. Chang specializes in and speaks frequently to audiences about comparative perspectives on human rights, peace and security, as well as the study of conflict and post-conflict transitions. Her current work addresses intersections of self-determination and human rights, which she puts into practice through her Fulbright specialist position with the Center for Human Rights, Multiculturalism and Migration at the University of Jember, East Java in Indonesia. Of her forthcoming articles, one is particularly germane to today's lecture topic, uh, and it's entitled The UN and West Papua Self-Determination, Lingering Conceptions of Civilization in the Decolonization Process. Today, we are very pleased to showcase our alumna, Dr. Cheng, and she'll speak to us about her work in this region. We'll try to allocate 10 to 15 minutes for discussion after her presentation and encourage attendees to enter their questions in the Q&A section. Without further ado, I happily present Netherlands, New Guinea, 1949 to 1962, a civilizing mission in the era of decolonization. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Grace Cheng back to UH Manoa. Over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Stark. Thank you for this opportunity. And it's wonderful to be here, although virtually, but I feel like I am at home again. Um, and I'm very excited to talk about this project. Um, this is a relatively new work. And so a little bit of pause uh, on this project uh, with COVID. And hopefully this summer I can resume it uh, with uh, doing for in the Netherlands. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the region. I'm not sure how many of you may be uh, familiar with this part of the world. It is uh, going to, there are various names for it. And so I, that's why I specified the years, the period in which I'm talking about, uh, which where, when it was called the Netherlands, New Guinea, it was an area of the former Dutch East Indies, uh, which the Dutch reclaimed, retained after the independence of Indonesia in 1949. And um, currently, and since 1969, this territory has been part of Indonesia, although there is a self-determination movement uh, uh, by the indigenous people, uh, the West Papuans. And so this, this is what it is contemporarily referred to, um, although also referred to by its Indonesian refer references. Um, but the uh, West Papuan movement for self-determination did bring to the United Nations petitions in recent years, 2017 and 2019, to request that the United Nations revisit the so-called act of free choice that resulted in the incorporation of West Papua into the Republic of Indonesia in 1969. So this presentation is based on research that builds on uh, some, some of the research I found for that uh, essay that Professor Stark mentioned, which sought to understand uh, the UN's failure to more rigorously defend West Papua's right to self-determination. And that act of free choice did not, you know, by many accounts, uh, many perspectives did not regard it to meet, have met international standards for the exercise of self-determination. And so in recent years, there's been a revival in this question, particularly uh, of self-determination issues, especially in the context of increasing concerns about human rights abuses uh, in, the, in the region. So this presentation gives a bit of background, and I said various names uh, of uh, how that territory is referred to. Um, in 1949, which is uh, when the uh, Ind Indonesians gained their independence, um, they claimed this part as uh, this, this territory as part of its state territory, uh, referring to it as Riambarat. It's changed sort of as uh, administrative units uh, 
uh, into different provinces. So uh, generally, I will uh, probably not refer to it that because we're not referring talking too much about the Indonesian period. Um, focusing more on the Dutch perspective, Dutch um, after it relinquished uh, Indonesia to become its own independent state, it continued to claim this territory and so referred to it as the Netherlands, New Guinea, uh, a separate portion of, of Indonesia. And, um, you know, the, the, this was something that the Dutch did because it was very difficult to get agreement to ratify uh, the treaty that, that uh, gave independence to Indonesia because most of the Dutch population at the time had a negative op opinion about an independent uh, East Indies. So uh, by unilaterally actually uh, changing one of the earlier agreements with the Indonesian, the Dutch could retain control over a bit of its former colony in, South, in, in this part of the world. Um, and that made it possible to get an agreement, uh, a majority to agree on Indonesia's independent within the Dutch chambers of government. And so this is a really interesting um, topic, uh, looking at the literature, there's a lot of contemporary reflections, which, you know, look at the Dutch period in this part of the world um, in relatively positive terms, because the Netherlands did ostensibly at least uh, support West Papuan self-determination. And, um, you know, because of developments in the post 1962 period also, you know, looks less favorable um, compared to sort of some, you know, so, some focus on, on the support that uh, at least the Netherlands nominally gave to West Papuan uh, independence. Um, but a lot of academic literature does not reflect such a positive assessment. Um, works going further back tend to be more critical, including Aaron Lippard's The Trauma of Decolonization, The West and West New Guinea, which is another term for, for this region. Um, and Lippard characterized Dutch foreign policy concerning the territory as motivated by its colonial resentment against its former colony, Indonesia. So its inability to accept Indonesian independence as the main motivator uh, for holding on to uh, West New Guinea, which is what it was called before 1949. Um, so many Dutch historians continue to have this point of view. So the Dutch policy regarding this territory was strongly influenced by its position on Indonesia on the one hand, the Netherlands wanted to use the territory as a Dutch sphere of influence in the region, including for some time Dutch settlement. And on the other hand, by developing this region and ostensibly preparing the Papuan population for independence as part of the modern world of nation states, the Netherlands wanted to vindicate itself as a responsible colonial power. And so from 1946 to the end of the 60s, the so-called Indonesian question and the question of West Irian or West New Guinea, like I said, many names to refer to the territory, uh, figured on in one form or another on the agenda of the organs of the United Nations. So in the dispute with Indonesia over the status of this region, um, the Dutch would claim that the territory was not part of its uh, administration of, it, of the Dutch East Indies. It did acknowledge that it had set up administrative posts in 1898 and 1902 in three areas um, to sort of press against the expansion of British and German control in the East. Um, and so they, they argued that there was very little activity beyond that. It was mostly sort of this geostrategic kind of posturing. Um, and then in 1939, they were concerned about uh, a Japanese takeover of Indonesia. And so, uh, you know, also, you know, considered it important strategically, but never governed it as part of the Dutch East Indies. So that was one of the critical aspects of its case uh, at the United Nations for holding on to the territory. But even before the so-called uh, trauma of decolonization, uh, West New Guinea 
as it was called in the this period in the early 20th century, uh, it became of increasing interest to the Dutch um, because from the 1920s onward, especially uh, when in the Indonesian independence was growing, uh, movement was growing, there were proponents of people who sought some home in that part of the world of Dutch people uh, outside of, of the it, what became Indonesia in 1949. So there were proponents of Dutch settlement in that part of, of New Guinea. And this, repla this reflected, you know, um, you know uh, beginning even before there was a strong independence movement among Indonesians um, in the early 20th century, uh, because of growing population in the Dutch East Indies uh, with the flourishing export markets in tea and, and mining and, and so forth. Um, so the Dutch population in the East Indies grew from just a few thousand in 1870 to 300,000 um, Europeans and Eurasians in 1940. So this was an idea that this was sort of a virgin empty land that was ideal for settlement for uh, you know, those seeking land and a place to settle. And particularly for Eurasians, which um, from 1901, when the Dutch ad government adopted an ethical policy, recognizing native rights in the East Indies, um, this made more, uh, this, this took away some opportunities from Eurasians in the East Indies because there was preference to hiring native of the East Indies and governments instead of Eurasians, which was typical previously. And Eurasians seemed to lack the status of Europeans. So there were several groups of Eurasian uh, settle, you know, the groups pr proposing Eurasian settlement uh, emerging from the 20s and 30s in particular. And they generally would characterize the land as being empty of law because uh, they felt that the people, the indigenous people were uh, so-called too primitive uh, to have any such kinds of concepts. Um, they had very demeaning racist characterizations of, of Papuans, um, basically typical of some other colonial discourse, which regarded indigenous peoples as having no future, um, and especially the, of, of the uh, people, native people of, of the territory as, as evolving so slowly uh, that they would be impervious to change. So eventually this land would be left empty because of the inevitable de demise in their minds of the native Papuans. And so would make room for a new New Guinea nation of Dutch Eurasians. But others were kinder about native peoples. Um, they argued that the natives were crying out for guidance and protection in the wake of Indonesian struggle for independence. Um, this reflected their negative experience of uh, the Japanese, particularly the period of Japanese occupation, um, in which there was collaboration between the Indonesian nationalists and the Japanese. Um, but there was really very little in terms of activity to help the natives in West Papua. And so by the time of 19, the end of World War II, 1945, uh, in August of that year when Indonesia declared independence, although the Dutch had not accepted that, um, there was still very little Dutch impact in the territory, um, especially in regards to helping natives of, of, of the land. Um, it was deemed unprofitable by many Dutch industries. Um, so, you know, as, as Indonesia was clamoring for independence, uh, the the uh, Indonesians and, and Netherlands did come to an agreement in a, in a gathering on, in a meeting on uh, November 1946 in Linga And there uh, called for a creation of a Netherlands-Indonesia union. And that was the first time that New Guinea was really mentioned um, in the context of, 
of the deliberations about what would happen with uh with the Dutch East Indies, but it wasn't discussed as 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 a, a people. It was discussed mostly as a land, including as a homeland for Eurasians. Um, very not any talk about self determination for the natives. And so, at the time of Indonesia's imminent independence in 1949, the Dutch unilaterally amended this agreement and and called for uh, the separation of West New Guinea um, from the wet rest of the, what would become the independent Indonesian Republic. Um, so at the time this was possible because in the United Nations, there was not very strong support for the idea that decolonization meant decolonization of the whole colonial unit. Um, so that was not you know, in the works. Indonesia responded by demanding that the status of West Papua, yes, it can remain under the Dutch for one year, but after that, it would reopen negotiations about what the status of that territory would be. Um, so in the meantime, efforts to settle uh, the, the territory by the Dutch were continuing. Um, the Dutch Foundation established a National New Guinea Committee um, they created a transnational transmigration council. Uh, there were uh, New Guinea study circles in Amsterdam uh, with lecture series uh, to promote uh, interests among officials, uh, missionaries, businessmen, prospective pioneers, and so forth. Um, but you know, businesses were very cautious because they were uncertain about what the status of that area would be. And so uh, there was not really, these were not very, very successful as far as recruiting settlements by the Dutch there. And there were also frequent reports of abuses of native peoples that were very concerning. So as it became clearer that uh, decolonization may be inevitable, the Dutch government sort of shifted its position from maintaining Dutch rule on in West New Guinea um, to ostensibly preparing the Papuans for self-determination. And they did so in order to prevent takeover by Indonesia, which was increasingly hostile to the Dutch presence. Despite a general trend within the United Nations in favor of decolonization, um, there remains strong concern that many subject peoples were not prepared for self-government. And besides a small block of newly independent states, most states at the time didn't regard establishing a time frame for granting independence to colonies to be an important matter. So therefore, by reframing its continued rule as serving the preparation of West Papuans for self-determination. The Dutch gained time to establish a presence there as it claimed that the process could possibly take centuries. And the Netherlands, in addition, launched an international campaign to undermine Indonesia's claim that the region was historically integrated into the rest of Indonesia. And instead, the Dutch claimed that the Papuans had been completely isolated, this is a quote, a uh, quoted phrase, completely isolated from the rest of humankind, devoid of any form of his, of civilization up until the advent of colonial rule, end of quote. So the Dutch explained that prior to the Second World War, they only administered 5% of West Papua, uh, and that was deliberate because it was a deliberately slow effort to develop the Papuans due to their concerns that such a quote, delicate task could disrupt the social fabric of the tribes given their extreme isolation. So as long, along with the characteriz characterization of the development of West New Guinea as a long-term process without any guarantee of success, the Netherlands asserted that it, that it was the only country that could really meet the requirements of Article 73 of the UN Charter 
which obligated the states holding responsibilities for the administration of non self governing territories to, among other things, develop self government to take due account of the political aspiration of the peoples and to assist them in the progressive development of their free political institutions according to the particular circumstances of each territory and its peoples and their various stages of development. So the Dutch viewed the spatial distribution of, of the natives of Papua as, as debilitating, debil as extremely isolating and debilitating for their development. Um, they felt, they argued they could rectify it and launched a civilizing process to bring natives to areas where they could, quote, benefit from the civilized world, unquote. And so there were efforts to bring teachers, 5,000 teachers, uh, flown in um, training of naval cadets, army brigades, and so forth. Uh, so requiring bringing in significant numbers of personnel and also enhancing the role of missionaries um, characterized as being selflessly devoted um, were able to handle the challenge of the complex belief systems of native communities and were, were, were motivated by their humanitarian duties to so-called backward populations and boasted of the conversion of many native Papuans to Christianity. So the Dutch regarded themselves as much more qualified to guiding Papuans near towards this than the Asiatic Indonesians as they had more resources and more advanced methods uh, and contemporary notions of how to develop a people. As time grew on, calls for decolonizations grew stronger and the Dutch became more concerned about retaining international support as tensions with Indonesia increased over West Papua or Netherlands, New Guinea, as the time it's called. A 1953 Dutch report recommended to the government that it, it makes certain that the international community was sufficiently aware of the, quote, primitive, unquote, character of West Papuans. It advised the government to adopt the proactive approach to convincing the international community of the legitimacy of Dutch tutelage and called on Dutch diplomats and officials to provide the UN with a clear picture of, quote, a clear picture of that primitiveness, unquote, so that member states could understand that the modernization of the land would inevitably prove a long process. And the Dutch at the time were not the only ones to invoke the role of a more advanced people burdened with the sacred trust of, of civilization. Um, in the early 1950s, the belief that some peoples were not ready for complete self-government was still widely held throughout the international community, including by some national uh, African nationalist elites, such as Leopold Sangor of Senegal and Ivory Coast leader, who uh, Felix Hufiet Ruli of Ivory Coast, who campaigned for the end of traditional forms of colonial rule, but still viewed meant that many African peoples were poorly equipped for immediate uh, independence. So they these figures argued for colonial authorities instead to provide tutelage necessary to prepare native society for self-government. And the Dutch built on this idea of the African people's so-called backwardness uh, by pointing out some fi similar physical features of Africans and Papuans to construct the idea of their common race and characterizing the people of Netherlands, New Guinea as akin to Africans in terms of levels of civilization as compared to other peoples in the Dutch East Indies. So therefore, the Dutch ability to win support in the 1950s had much to do with this campaign to promote the image of Papuans uh, that required that 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 made them require a lengthy period of tutelage before they were ready to exercise the right of self-determination. 
and the Dutch would provide this tutelage for representing themselves as benign, as a benign and benevolent power performing a historically necessary task of lifting West Papuans out of their so-called primitive condition. So the civilizing process was a uh, so-called civilizing process, let's say, uh, is indeed proved difficult in the end. Um, the migration of communities uh, of natives of Papua from their lands in the interiors to the coastal uh, areas required a tremendous amount of resources which were not made available. Um, their, the agricultural process projects that the Dutch uh, set up were not very successful. There were reports of great disenchantment among the Papuans who were relocated um, due to, including due to the fact that many of the promises made to them uh, did not actually manifest. And you know, investment, the economy really faltered. There was a great difficulty surveying the territory, uh, required airplanes that could be hampered by weather and all sorts of technical issues. Um, so there was the lack of exploration, you know, deterring com companies from, from moving in. Uh, so by the light, late 1950s, there was little commercial interest and uh, there was, you know, concerned that the area required too much investment to for companies to be interested. And the lack of process progress, excuse me, the lack of progress in Netherlands, New Guinea confirmed the skepticism of many Latin American and African states about whether the Netherlands had any intention of ever relinquishing West Papua. Some in the United Nations argued that the sacred mission of Europeans is a failure and asserted that the security and future of the natives of West Papua was linked to that of country and region until its inhabitants were able to determine their own destiny. Uh, many expressed skepticism that this was a ploy to justify extended Dutch control in the region and that the information already provided by the Dutch uh, convinced them that self-determination would not likely come for centuries and it, that it did not seem to be a movement by Papuans themselves. To an emerging block of anti-colonial states, which included Indonesia, decolonization was an urgent matter of human rights and economic development because this block was unconvinced that entrusting the preparation of peoples to colonial authority would yield better results than the League's mandate system, which had established economic structures differing little from those under colonial rule. And in 19... 55, this group of African and Asian states met in the Javanese city of Bandung, the famous Bandung gathering. And this anti-colonial bloc submitted four resolutions on West Papua, which failed to gain general assembly approval between 1953 uh, to 1957. So in November, 1957, the governments of the Netherlands and Australia announced a joint policy of cooperation to prepare all the people of the island of Papua, including Netherlands, New Guinea, the Australian colony of Papua, and the trust territory of New Guinea for self-determination. In response, Indonesia stepped up efforts to change the Dutch position by force, launching, launching large-scale anti-Dutch attacks involving the confiscation of Dutch property and businesses and the expulsion of some 46,000 Dutch nationals, including Eurasian in December of 1957. So while the anti-colonial bloc and nationalist movements began to steer international opinion in favor of decolonization in 1957, a nationalist government emerged in The Hague, which was in favor of keeping 
Netherlands, New Guinea, and it made it, po and made it possible for Dutch conscripts to fight in colonies overseas. On March 29, 1960, the Secretary of State for the Netherlands, New Guinea, Theo Bott, urged the Dutch government to adopt a program to prepare West Papuans for self-determination within 10 years time and to highlight the efforts of the Dutch in this task, representing them as an anti-colonial authority that eschewed old forms of colonialism while meeting the requirements of Article 73 of the UN Charter. Around that same period, Katanga's attempted secession from Congo in 1960, July 1960, intensified the anti-colonial bloc's efforts to reject the application of self-determination to cases beyond decolonization and heightened their suspicion that those supporting breakaway regions desired to undermine post-colonial states. But the Dutch did not give up their efforts to prevent Indonesia from claiming its Netherlands, New Guinea. The representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations declared the government's proposal for West Papuan self-determination at the General Assembly in October 1960. They also, the Dutch also launched a global media campaign inviting foreign researchers, journalists, filmmakers to Netherlands, New, New Guinea, and provided material and logistic support for the production of documentary capturing the so-called primitive nature of native peoples being transformed under Dutch authority. The Netherlands also sent troops to Netherlands, New Guinea in late 1960 and 1961 and sought to exploit a split that had emerged among Afro-Asian states. The Dutch government reached out in particular to a group of 12 former French colonies known as the Brazzaville Group after its first gathering in that city in December 1960. And in September 1961, the group established the African and Malagasy Union and issued the Declaration of Tananarive, asserting that all peoples had the right of self-determination and made explicit reference to the case of Netherlands, New Guinea. And some months later, Senegalese President Leopold Sadar Sangor was among the Nash African nationalists who favored federation with French instead of immediate independence pronounced that, quote, we are not going to hand over blacks to semi-yellows, unquote. So with the support of the Brazzaville group and critical Western powers, the Netherlands put Netherlands New Guinea on the General Assembly's agenda in 1961 with a proposal to prepare the people of the territory for eventual self-government under the direction of the trusteeship council with the Netherlands serving as a trust authority. The proposal failed to pass, but Dutch efforts to prepare, to prepare West Papua or Netherlands New Guinea to participate in an act of self-determination were already underway with the inauguration of the new Guinea Council as a self-governing uh, body on April 5th, 1961. The, there were numerous international dignitaries attending this inauguration, including Australia, New Zealand, France, and the United Kingdom. The US did not attend. Uh, Theo Bott announced an, that the earlier 10-year plan for self-determination would be abandoned and requested that the New Guinea Council make its decision on self-determination within the year on whether the council would choose independence or continued association with the Netherlands. In 1961, December, Dutch authorities organized a, con a ceremony to raise the West Papuan flag, shown here, alongside the Dutch flag. And the New Guinea Council declared the day of the flag raising ceremony a public holiday and issued a statement calling for international support of its self determination. Indonesian President Sukarno responded, announcing Indonesia's plan to mobilize its forces to thwart the establishment of the so-called puppet, what it called the puppet state of West Papua and to raise the Indonesian flag in West Papua. And supporting Indonesia's effort was the non-aligned conference in Belgrade in 1961, September, uh, which concluded with a demand for the immediate and total abolition of colonial control throughout the world. The, union, the United Nations failure to respond 
to Indonesia's takeover of Goa, which gained its independence from, from Portugal, uh, never discussing the question of Goan self-determination in that international body. That portended the rise of the anti-colonial blocs influencing in the United Nations and the sidelining of, of questions of self-determination that were not associated with ending colonial rule. Indian, India had asserted Goa was an integral part of India and similarly justified its actions as, as Indonesia did as self-defense against colonialism, which it characterized as permanent aggression. And over the next nine months, Indonesian forces would also resort to force. The United States, which had already felt that the Netherlands was provoking Indonesia by sending troops, abandoned its previously neutral stance on the dispute and joined the growing international pressure on the Dutch to return to negotiations with Indonesia on the issue of West Papua. With the sinking of an Indonesian torpedo boat in 1962 January, the US sent Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy to Jakarta to communicate that the United Nations was trying to find a solution that would reflect Indonesia's interests. And during the same period, Australia was also thinking, rethinking its support for the Dutch position on West Papua, given the threat of a large scale confrontation in the region. Australia's ambassador in Indonesia pressed for a change in Australia's position, arguing that given the quote, the primitive condition of West Papua, they could not in practice meaningfully exercise the right to self-determination, which anyway was not a principle universally applicable to all peoples. So in 1961, Bot, Theobot proposed that the Dutch government send an invitation to African countries to visit West Papua to persuade them that they consider whether it was acceptable that Indonesia would gain sovereignty over territory with a Negro, so-called Negroid population straight away. Only a Bravalta and Dahomey sent delegations in April 1962, but the Dutch gained support for its position at the United Nations. In the, with the intensification of tensions threatening to draw Soviet involvement in the region, the US urged the Dutch and Indonesians back to the negotiating tables. And as they came to realize that they would be unable to hold West Papua without US, British and Australian support, the Dutch halted their efforts to, to advocate for West Papua self-determination. This came in the form of the New York Agreement signed in August 15, 1962, which called for the Dutch to transfer administrative authority to the United Nations Temporary Executive Authority for a period of at least seven months, after which the territory would be administered by Indonesia. Stipulated that Indonesia would make arrangements with the assistance participation of the United Nations representative and a staff to give the people of the territory the opportunity to exercise freedom of choice on the question to remain with or sever ties with Indonesia. And the, the agreement also specified that such arrangements could include establishing the eligibility of all adults, male and female, to participate in an act of self-determination to be carried out in accordance to international practice before the end of 1969. Um, this is the act of free choice mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, um, which many international observers uh, were very critical of because of the manner in which it was carried out. Uh, there was criticism of the failure of, of the United Nations to ensure that the West Papuans could exercise self-determination in line with international practice. Um, there was a lack, there was no actually an absence of United Nations experts uh, on the territory during the 1963-69 period as should have taken place. Um, and the United Nations representative in, at the time became, it was called then West Irian after 1962, uh, the representative uh, or Tisans um, did 
continue to urge UN member states that it may be difficult for a plebiscite with universal vote to take place. But he did urge Indonesia to reconsider the method that it had proposed for the act of self-determination, which was the so-called Indonesian method of uh, Musyawara, where only elected, selected, only selected representatives could vote for their designated areas with the outcome decided through consultation. The Netherlands, however, joined Indonesia in a joint statement in 1969 May, agreeing that this method was appropriate. And internal communications reflect that officials of the United Nation, the United Kingdom, the United States, Australia thought this was a good idea. So in the end, rather than a close one person, one vote, the so-called act of free choice was an open vote by 1,022 representatives. Only 16 UN staff members were actually on hand for the act of free choice as compared to a thousand observers of the East Timor referendum of 1999. And the result of the act of free choice was a unanimous vote in favor of remaining with Indonesia. At the General Assembly discussions about the conclusion, conclusion of the UN mission in West Papua, many African states, not only from the Brazzaville group, objected to the act of free choice and condemned representations of West Papuan primitiveness as a pretext to deny them self-determination. Speeches by representatives of Zambia, Togo, Ghana, Sierra Leone particularly emphasized this issue with the representative of, from Togo charging that the format of the act of free choice was contrary to the UN's earlier resolution the representative from Sierra Leone proclaimed that no society could be said to be so primitive, and no terrain so geographically difficult in the modern world, that the vital exercise of democratic government should be indefinitely de denied to its peoples. In calling for a postponement of self-determination with a plebiscite to be held in 1975, a Ghanaian delegate referred to the Australian Papua New Guinea, which is inhabited by the same peoples when, and the principles of one man, one vote is being successfully used. And a somewhat enlightened policy is being applied there in leading peoples towards eventual self-rule. The resolution put forth by African states on this issue was defeated. 60 to 15 with 39 obsession, abstentions. The matter of West Papua self-determination was closed after the United Nations General Assembly approved resolution 2504 in November 19, 1969, which took note of the outcome of the act of free speech and the reports of the Secretary General, UN representative in West Irian and Indonesia. So in recent years, rights advocates have condemned Indonesia as a neo-colonial power. But the late Tracy Banivadua Mar aptly labels West Papua as a transnational companies, co colony where numerous powerful interests have colluded in support of Jakarta in the governance of West Papua since and even before 1969. Western policy in West Papua has long been driven by self-interest in, beginning with the Dutch. And by the time of the West Papuan flag raising in 1961, Royal Dutch Shell and other companies already deeply invested in the profitable research resources discovered during the Dutch rule. With the demise of the left-leaning Sukarno government by 1966, the American and Indonesian interests were already busy carving up West Papua's rich natural resources at the founding of ASEAN. Later that year, Indonesia signed a concession agreement with American mining company Freeport with one of its mines depicted on this slide, which has contributed significantly to Indonesia's GDP. While Indonesia was not keen on seeing West Papuans choose independence in 1969, the US was also concerned that UN members would demand direct elections and sought to ensure that Ortiz Sands would not insist on that. And so we are left, uh, with the status today, um, which is quite dire as far as some recent reports 
uh, by United Nations Human Rights Special Rapporteurs. Uh, but I will end it here so we have some time for discussion. Um, and thank you so much for listening and attending. Uh, and happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions to start us off um, and I'll just moderate. Uh, we'll get to you, Rick, in a minute, but uh, Immaculata Kurnia Santi had asked, as you mentioned that the Dutch sent 500 missionaries to Netherlands, New Guinea, could you explain more about it? And more recently, are there Christian missionaries from Bandung, West Java? Where are they? What happened to these families? Uh, after Netherlands, New Guinea became part of Indonesia. So can you talk a little bit about that process? So as far as the missionaries, um, I, I finished the, uh, the book chapter that, that uh, Professor Stark had mentioned earlier um, in 2019, and I was in the Netherlands to conduct research for this presentation. Um, and that summer I was going to go, uh, or the summer of COVID, I was going to go back to the Netherlands um, to collaborate with a Dutch scholar uh, on that very question. And so we're gonna hopefully do that this summer. So hopefully I can answer that in the future a little bit better about the, yeah, about the missionary work. Yeah, it is uh, a Dutch scholar that, that is, is, has been working on that very topic. And, and so I'll be working with him on a joint project this summer. Thanks a lot. I think a lot of us have the question that Rick asked. Um, but given that Papua New Guinea has been independent since 1975, he says, I wonder what you think about where this leaves self-determination for this region today, particularly since you ended your talk by discussing how it, the U.S. and at least U.S. corporations are in some ways complicit in keeping it uh, dependent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were so many Cold War considerations, I think, um, as far as, you know, Indonesia's threatening to, uh, uh, under Sukarno, to, to kind of uh, leaning towards the Soviet Union. And so at the time, I think there was a lot more interest in addressing Indonesia's, uh, Indonesia's position, uh, unlike in, on, in uh, Papua New Guinea. So uh, since then, there have been a couple of moves uh, among the Pacific Islands Forum to push for this issue to be on the UN agenda. Um, it's been unsuccessful. Uh, apparently in 2011, Ban Ki-moon uh, was approached by a number of, of uh, community members of organizations, and he did assert that the UN should do that all it could to ensure uh, this case would be looked into. And just within days of that, uh, the official spokesman for the Secretary General said, no, we would not. And so there's, it's been very, it's been very difficult. Um, and I think if you look at the, the United Nations Special Committee on Decolonization, which still exists because there's still numerous territories that don't have, uh, are not independent. Um, you know, this, this, is, this, this body has really been moving very slowly, uh, and that as many Pacific Island countries are, or, or, or Pacific Islands are uh, not self-governing still. And um, those who are, you know, in control of the, those territories, um, also in the Pacific as well, um, and that including the United States is one of those powers, uh, have they, ex they always argue that these, uh, these communities are not capable of self-determination because of their limited capabilities for self-government. Um, and they're, you know, they argue that they're likely candidates for state failure and would pose problems for international security. So in 86, the United Kingdom, and in, in 92, the United States, they, they both, they formally withdrew from the special Committee on Decolonization, um, and the United States and France uh, in the 1990s tried to abolish the com committee altogether. So, yeah, it is. Um, you know, I think Australia uh, could make that move in '75, but but because of the interests that you know, keeping Indonesia away from Soviet or orbit at the same time uh, failed, and subsequently this the move for decolonization has really waned. 
All right, first I'm gonna let Steve O'Hara talk and then we'll come back to, uh, then we'll come back to Veronica. So Steve, I think you can oh, talk now. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I was, I'm sorry, I joined the, the, the whole thing a bit late. Uh, I just wanna say hello to Grace and welcome her back to Hawaii. We're so happy to see her. Um, and my question really, she may have already covered this earlier, in which case uh, I don't want to take up too much. The United States in uh, right after the war with the Marshall, uh, Marshall Plan basically threatened the Dutch government that if they didn't uh, pull out of their colon colonial war in, in Indonesia, that the US would not uh, include them in the, in the Marshall uh, funding. And I'm wondering if this came up in Grace's uh, research and what effect it might have had on, on New Guinea. Yeah, that definitely did, you know, and I think, you know, the, the, the Dutch, you know, without that kind of external pressure probably would have, you know, preferred to to retain uh, its colony in in West, you know, West Papua. Um, yeah, there was certainly a lot of U.S. pressure based on with, withdrawing Marshall Plan aid. And, uh, you know, this issue, I think there, what the Dutch did as far as promoting its, uh, the legitimacy of its continued control over West Papua when Indonesia got its independence, I think it was very innovative. Um, you know, I don't think the United States uh, was that, you know, was that, uh, with, with, I think the United States is quite surprised, right, by all the moves that it made. Um, I think uh, it, it, the U.S. had hoped that, yeah, within the year, as Indonesia had demanded, um, the Netherlands and Indonesia would have resolved the status of the territory. Thanks. We have uh, another question from Veronica Kusumariati. Uh, oh no, a different person, I'm sorry. Veronica asks, Dutch and Papuan historians and scholars have written the historical dimension of West Papua's issues, including topics you're presenting here. What, what do you think the relevance of this scholarship is to contemporary conditions of indigenous Papuans? What's the lesson we can have from the stories you share here in terms of self-determination, decolonization, et cetera? What's at stake, do you think? Ooh, big questions. Yeah. Definitely very big questions, um, very interesting ones. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the way that for me, uh, the way that human rights has been politicized um, has been very interesting, you know, as far as, especially from the 70 onward, 70s onwards, when Western states began to integrate human rights into their foreign policies, um, it sort of replicated kind of a, uh, a new hierarchy of states, like those who are human rights enforcers, um, who, who should point out and pressure other states to, to adopt human rights standards. Um, I think, you know, a lot of it is, yeah, it's, it's kind of one dimensional because I think that there are so many practices as I was saying towards the end. And that's why I like uh, the late Tracy uh, Bunny, Bunny Manua's Mars perspective on, on this, the situation as being a transnational issue. There's so many transnational forces that are, are really you know, complicit in human rights violations and, um, and, and, not, you know, and, and not really moving forth in self-determination. I think there's so many different movements now, um, like the movements for indigenous rights, also for on, um, you know, on uh, small farmers and and other. There's a declaration on the rights of small farmers and those in 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 rural areas. Um, there's much more activity and representation. Of, of peoples historically that were marginalized and hopefully that will sort of coalesce um, over time. And, and you know, the, the role of states uh, does, is not the only one that steers um, our policies with regards to human rights and, and, and self-determination, but more the voices and representatives of, of peoples. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more question here. This is from, and I hope I'm this, 
not mispronouncing people's names, Susi Takunan, who says the development and attention given to West Papua by the current Indonesian government by building roads and infrastructure may have suggested that the population is more inclined to stay with Indonesia. Would this be an important factor that may contribute to the decline in the fervor of the separatist movement? And I just wanted to add, I'm not an Indonesianist, but back in 1988, when I was there in Java, people were talking about the pretty massive um, relocation of Javanese to, to this region. And it makes me wonder whether it's a little like what China's done. So if you could respond. Yeah, it's interesting, kind of these new settler colonies, right? Um, for these so-called frontier regions of, of now post-colonial states or in China's case, you know, anyway, not one of the colonizing states, yeah. Um, to the transmigration. I mean, you know, Indonesia in uh, Java does have like significant demographic pressures. And th this is interesting because the Dutch from the uh, late 19th century were already also bringing uh, people from Java over uh, to because, you know, they needed staff, they needed staffing, they needed personnel. And so I think, you know, a lot of the uh, economic interests that have descended onto West Papua um, are also interested, right, in, in this labor capacity. And so, you know, yeah, the, the reports recently, I think three weeks ago, the UN Special Rapporteurs on Indigenous Rights, on um, uh, executions like summary extrajudicial and, and arbitrary executions, and also on internally displaced persons, um, issued an, an emergency uh, requesting urgent humanitarian access to the territory to examine, yeah, what's been going on. So, uh, yeah, certainly not yeah, the same as, as with uh, Xinjiang in China, but yeah, it's definitely sort of a, there's a, a set, it's a new kind of settler colonial uh, activity. Yeah, I, I just thought Belt and Road when I saw the message from Susie Takunin. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about whether whether this is leading to a decline in the fervor? Do you think it's tamping it down? I mean, I can see that there are these forces encouraging the mm -hmm. Indonesian connection from the Indonesia side, but from the local side. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the thinking about self-determination by uh, scholars and, and pra legal practitioners by jurists has been, it, it's, it's never been very supportive of self-determinations of, of peoples. Um, the, they've always shied away from that um, because, you know, they, uh, the, I think in the thinking, they feel that peoples, the definition is so flexible, right? It's, it's, uh, it's hard to determine and it would, it would cause too much instability to recognize it, to recognize that anyone self-identifying as a distinct people could, could make that claim. And I think intellectually, like within uh, the legal thinking, it's, it's not been something that's, that's supported, unfortunately. I think it's, it's gotta be very much on the basis of political, uh, political, aspirations and and you know the concerns about the well-being like what is the best way to ensure the end of, of abuses um you know what kinds of yeah what kinds of incent you know what kinds of policies have have really helped to improve human rights and i think over the recent decades after the u.s uh in, and other western powers have adopted human rights into their foreign policies um, that's a really problematic record. It's uh, that kind of pressure, um, and some, you know, some scholars are are very concerned about, um, you know, not uh, having a more inclusive process. Uh, so, you know, I I don't know. I'm not sure exactly how it will how it will unfold. Um, I'm not. I haven't studied yet. Uh, very closely, uh, the self-determination uh, movements, uh, the you know the organizations and and those behind it. Um, so I don't know, uh, but I I do know the un 
you know, the human rights reports uh, that the special rapporteurs uh, are basing their their call urgent call for humanitarian access um, that uh, on the territory, right? There's some immediate immediate concerns that need to be addressed um, because the abuses sound very very significant. The hard question to answer. Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Well, we've come to the end of our time of, with a very stimulating, if worrisome, presentation, uh, scholarly and yet not entirely upbeat for the future. Um, we look forward to learning more from you, Grace, as you move forward with this research um, and hope for positive outcomes. Uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, your alma mater, and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies and the Center for Pacific Island Studies for talking, and, and to thank everyone who attended. It's been a real pleasure. Take care, stay safe, be well. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Everyone.